All right, today we're doing a second layer of review for quiz number seven. So the first skill that I'm presenting, I'm really trying to reinforce the reflexive property of congruence and the directionality that comes with it. So in this first problem, right, we see that common side right here, this segment, it's the same side for both triangles. So I can give it a triple tick mark. If I was writing this as a formal proof, my reason would be the reflexive property of congruence. But now I have to think about how I write the congruence statement. So if I look at the segment, let's say that I look at from this triangle perspective, I'm going from A to E. A to E. So I'm in between the single and triple tick mark sides to start. So for this triangle, I'm looking for the same starting position, the triple and the single tick mark sides. And I see, oh, well, that's still where A is to E. So here it reads the same way. AE is congruent to AE. We did not have to switch the order. So again, we're just looking at how we would link it up for the first triangle, and then how would we do it for the second one? And it ends up being the same direction, A to E, A to E. If we were writing a proof, our reason here would be because of side, 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 right? Linking up that common side, that is that third side that we needed to connect to have side, side, side as our combination. All right, this next one here, we're starting with a pair of sides that are both parallel and congruent. I'm gonna use my colors to highlight the parallels. It helps me see a little bit more clearly what I'm trying to build off of. All right, so those are my parallels. Here would be my transversal. So I'm seeing that that diagonal of a parallelogram right, is splitting into two congruent triangles, I just have to link up the proper corresponding parts. So based on those parallels in that transversal, the first thing that I can do is link up this pair of alternate interior angles. If I was citing this as a reason in a proof, I would say the alternate interior angles theorem. And then I see that common side right here, that shared side again. It's the same side for the triangle on top. It's the same side for the triangle on the bottom. So I'm gonna give it a double tick mark there. Again, if I was writing this in a proof, my reason would be the reflexive property of congruence. So now how would I write that common side? So in the first triangle, I'm reading it from A to K. So A to K like that. So look at that first triangle right here. It's from an angle that's not marked to the single tick mark angle right there. So if I look at the one on the bottom, which angle is not marked? Is it A or is it K, right? It's K here and then A here. So I see that in this case, my order reverses. If I name the first one A to K, for the second triangle, that would be K to A. If I was proving this and I said, well, what's your reason? Why are these triangles identical? Why are they congruent? We would see that we have side, angle, side. It's the angle that is sandwiched in between those two known sides, SAS. All right, the next skill I wanted to work through was just writing formal proofs. The more that you see it done, the more it starts to really sink in what the process is and how we layer information and connect the dots. Let me slide that up. So prove the triangles are congruent using side, 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 angle, side, a hypotenuse leg, angle, side, angle, or angle, angle, side. All right, so first up here, I'm given a whole bunch of givens. So I'm gonna look at that first given and see where that builds me. So let me write that first part first. 
Ri runs parallel to Nk, given. Now there's a time when we lump all of the givens together, and there's a time where we break them up. I think this is an appropriate time to break them up because it's easy to see how to build off the parallels. So here I know Ri is parallel to Nk. So again, I'm going to highlight those. I'm going to emphasize those and see what angle pair that's going to lead me to. So if I view this as my transversal, I now have a pair of corresponding angles right here and here. So let me write the next statement. I can say that angle R I B is congruent to angle N K I. Order matters. Okay, I identified those corresponding angles, so my reason would be the corresponding angles postulate. All right, I'm kind of at a dead end for that part of the given, right? I use this part right here. The next one tells me that Ri is congruent to Nk, so let's write that down and see if that builds us anywhere else. Ri is congruent to Nk, given. I'm going to mark the picture with tick marks. So here, here, right, those segments are congruent. It's kind of a dead end. It doesn't lead me anywhere else. So let me pick up the other given. So point I bisects BK. So point I right here bisects this segment right here. So if I'm bisecting something, that means that I'm dividing it into two matching parts, two congruent parts. So I can show that with tick marks, that these two segments have to match. They have to be identical. They're perfectly congruent. So here, again, that was a given. And then building off of that, I can say that segment BI is congruent to segment IK. I'm just building off of that language of bisect. So my reason would be the definition of bisect. So now I look at my picture and I think, well, what have I connected? I've connected two pairs of sides and they're included angles right there. So my triangles have to match. I have the side angle side combination. So I can get to my conclusion right here. BRI, triangle BRI is congruent to triangle INK, side angle side. All right, next up, B. So here is my diagram. In this case, I have two givens. And again, I'm trying to prove that these two triangles are congruent. We see this type of diagram a lot, right? We're trying to show that any parallelogram divides into two congruent triangles. It's by rotation. It's this triangle rotating into this position 180 degrees, but we give you different starting points. So it just depends on what your entry point is that leads you on a certain path to connect the dots to get to your desired conclusion. So in this one, I'm starting you off with again, two givens. I'll start with that first one right here, that SA runs parallel to ND. Given. So again, I'm going to take my colors, emphasize in red, these are parallel pathways. I'm going to elongate that diagonal here and view it as my transversal. So where does that build me to? That builds me to this pair of alternate interior angles being congruent. 
So if I name the first one SAD, it would be congruent to NDA. My reason would be the alternate interior angles theorem. All right, I'm at a dead end, so I pick up the next given right there. So I can say that angle S is congruent to angle N given. Mark the picture, so here and here. Those angles would have to match, right? We're told that information. So now we know that we need a pair of sides and we're gonna pick up our pair of sides from that shared side, that common side right here, right? We're using the reflexive property of congruence, right? We know that it's the same side for the triangle on top as it is for the triangle on the bottom. So now it's just a matter of how we write that statement. When I call the first one AD, how do I complete that statement? Do I call the second one AD as well or DA? So remember, we're looking at the directionality. If I read the top one from A to D, I'm linking up the single tick mark angle to the one that's not marked. So for the one below it, that would go in the opposite direction. That would go from D to A. Reflexive property of congruence. We're linking something back to itself. That segment matches itself perfectly. So now looking at what we have, can we reach our conclusion? We have two pairs of corresponding angles and we have the side that is not included. If it was included, it would be sandwiched right in between those two marked angles. So we're ready to reach our conclusion that triangle SAD is congruent to triangle NDA. And our reason would be angle, angle, side. All right, moving on to the next one. I'm trying to show you many different variations of the skill. Let me slide that over. Okay, so in this next one, here is my pretty picture. And I'm told that point A, so here is A, is the midpoint of this segment PK right here. So let's start with that given statement. So point A is the midpoint of segment PK given. All right, well, what does it mean for a point to be a midpoint of a larger segment? If we have a midpoint, right, it's the middle point. It's right smack in the middle. It divides a larger segment into two congruent parts. So from here, that can lead me to segment PA. So PA is congruent to KA. Let's say that you're not sure about the, the directionality quite yet as to how you write that statement. You can always look at your conclusion, what you're trying to build to. And here I can see that P to A would link up with K to A, right? That always helps me just to confirm that I'm writing it in the correct order. Okay, my reason, well, I'm building off the language of midpoint that I'm told right here. So I'm citing the definition of midpoint. All right, so now I'm, I'm at a dead end. So now I pick up the next given. So my next given is that angle three is congruent to four. Given. Mark your picture. So this angle here to this angle here. Okay, so what's nice about that, right? It gives us a pair of angles to build off of, but I have to get inside of my triangles, right? It's not enough just to give me those angles that are exterior angles. So from here, I need to show that, well, these two angles here and here, they're supplementary because they form a linear pair, and so are these right here. 
So my next layer in step four would say, well, I know that one and three, angle one and three, are supplementary. I'm going to abbreviate that. And so are two and four. They are also supplementary angles. And my reason for knowing that is that I can see that there's that straight pathway that together they form a linear pair. So my reason is the linear pair property. All right, so once I'm establishing that link, that these are supplements, that these are supplements, and that these angles are congruent, that gets me to the inside space to show that angle one and two, well, those have to be supplements as, or they have to be congruent because their supplements are congruent. So supplements, one and two, of these congruent angles, three and four, have to also be congruent. So I can get to step five, at least for how I'm building my proof, and say that angle one is congruent to angle two because of the congruent supplements theorem. Let me mark those angles next, so here. And then let me say that back just a little bit slower. These angles were given as congruent. We established that these are supplementary. So are these because they form a linear pair. So we should be able to link up one and two. Supplements of congruent angles also have to be congruent, right? That's how we're using this reason, the congruent supplements theorem, to connect those angles. So now I have a pair of angles, I have a pair of sides, I need another pair of angles or sides, and I can see that, oh, I got these vertical angles right here. So the angle right here would have to be congruent to the angle right there. So here in step six, I can say that angle PAS is congruent PAS to KAR. Vertical angles theorem. Anytime we see a pair of vertical angles, we know that they are congruent. All right, so now I'm ready to reach my conclusion. Right, I've shown that my triangles are identical. They're congruent. Triangle SAP is congruent to triangle RAK. I have two pairs of corresponding angles that match that are congruent, and I have their included sides that match as well. So my reason here would be angle, side, angle. All right, next one. So here I'm given that uh, this triangle GMS is isosceles. So this triangle is isosceles with this base GS, and I'm given a pair of angles. Now, in these proofs, sometimes we're trying to show that these two smaller triangles here and here are congruent, and sometimes we want the big one here and the big one here. So I'm going to go ahead and look at what I'm trying to prove, and I'm just going to emphasize which pair of triangles it is. So GAS, that means I want this big guy right here. I'm going to highlight it like that. And any time that I have triangles that are overlapping in this way, I think it helps to flesh them out as two separate triangles. So I'm going to do that right here really quickly. So I'm going to draw out triangle GAS. So here's GAS. And then the other triangle that I'm trying to match it to right here, which is S here, E here and G here. So again, that just helps me to visualize what my end game is going to be. What is it that I'm trying to match up? Okay, so my first given, let's start with that. There's got to be a reason that we're told that this is an isosceles triangle. So triangle GMS is isosceles with base GS given. Okay, so if I look at this triangle right here, I know it's isosceles.
do I want to build off the knowledge that I have two congruent sides, two congruent legs here and here? Would that help me build this proof? Or would it help me to know that these two angles, these two base angles are congruent? Would that be more helpful? So imagine if I'm using this side to this side. Well, that's not a side for this triangle that I've highlighted. So linking up the sides is actually not going to help me. It must be the angles. So I want to show that because it's isosceles, I have a pair of angles, base angles, that are congruent. And if I look at my diagram that's split apart, that's saying this angle right here, right? That's the angle right there. And for this triangle, that's the angle right here. So I'm going to add that to my picture and write my next statement. The angle A, S, G, A, S, G is going to be congruent to E, G, S. So I'm going to write my reason as a statement. So if a triangle is isosceles, then we have two congruent angles. There are base angles if we're being technical. All right, so we've made our first link off of that first given. So now I'll go to the next given, which is that angle A is congruent to angle E. So double tick mark here and here here and here. Angle A is congruent to angle E, given. All right, that's kind of a dead end. It doesn't lead me anywhere else. I know that I need a pair of sides in order to get to my conclusion. So I should see, oh, well, this side right here is the same side for both triangles here, here, I'm going to give a single tick mark on the big diagram, right? It's the same side for both triangles. So again, we're seeing reflexive properties show up. So here I'm going to say that GS is congruent to itself. But again, the order I write that matters. So if I'm going from G here to S over here, what does that look like for the other triangle? Well, that is starting with S and going to G. So the order flip-flops here, but regardless, it's the reflexive property of congruence. All right, I'm ready to reach my conclusion, right? I've shown that I have these two pairs of corresponding angles that are congruent, and I have this one pair of corresponding sides. They are not included, but they're also congruent. So I can get to my end game that triangle GAS is congruent to SEG, I have angle, angle, side. All right, so hit me hard with lots of proofs, trying to give you all the different variations of the skill. And then let's flip a page and go on to example three. Let's try to break it up a little bit so we're not writing proofs the entire time. All right, so here I'm going back to some of our isosceles triangle problems. So in this one here, I'm saying that it's an isosceles triangle. I'm calling it BAY, and I'm saying that A is the vertex angle. So I like to visualize that, I'm not drawing it perfectly to scale, but I'm going to give myself just a visual anchor. So I'm saying that A is the vertex angle. So if I make these my legs, these my base angles then A has to be this angle right here. It doesn't really matter where I put B and Y because they have to be the same anyways. There are base angles. Okay, so now I'm saying that the vertex angle, angle A, is 10 less than three times the base angle. So it doesn't matter which base angle we're talking about because angle B and Y are both base angles. So let's say that a base angle is defined as X. So B and Y would both be X degrees. And then the measure of A, the vertex angle, would be 10 less than three times X. So three X minus 10 degrees. All right, so I've defined all of my angles. Now I'm gonna build an equation. 
So if I add my x's, I have five of them. So 5x take away 10 has to sum to 180. We know that every triangle has measures that add to 180. From here, we're going to add the 10. So 5x equals 190. Divide that 5 away, and we get that x is 38. Okay, so the two base angles then have a measure of 38 degrees. And then the vertex angle, we're doing 3 times 38. So 114, take away 10, and we're at 104. Okay, the measure I wanted was the measure of y. So my final answer is 38 degrees. I always like to plug in for all the angle measures just to confirm that they sum to 180, and they most definitely do. All right, next up here. I'm given an isosceles triangle. I can see that because I have at least two sides that are the same. Here are my legs. I want to solve for x. I want to solve for y. So if I do x first, I know that these two legs are congruent. So I can build an equation where x minus 8 equals the square root of x minus 2. Okay, I want that square root isolated. It is, so I can reverse the operation. I can unlock the square root by squaring both sides, raising both sides to the second power. So in doing so here, I really have to visualize that this is a package. This is a binomial. It's made up of two terms. I need to see it that way. It's x minus 8 times x minus 8 all equal to x minus 2. And then what's on the left, I'm going to have to FOIL it out. I want to make sure that I'm multiplying out every component. So here is my first x squared. Here is my outer minus 8x. Here's my inner minus 8x. And here's the last plus 64, all equal to x minus 2. I'm going to consolidate my like terms. I see these two linear terms right here. So I have x squared minus 16x plus 64, all equal to x minus 2. All right, from here, I see it's a quadratic equation. I want to pull everything to one side. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract x and add 2. So x squared minus 17x. Oh, I wrote something wrong. Let me fix that. I see what I did. Hold on. I transferred it wrong. Here, let me make that correction. I read that wrong. I need to add 6. So this part should have been the square root of x minus 6. Sorry, guys. That took me a second to see that. All right. So let me change that here, 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 and here. Okay. I don't know why I read that as a 2. All right, so here it was x minus 6 right here. So I just changed that right there. So I'm really adding 6 over to the other side. So plus 70. All equal to 0. Okay, so now I have this quadratic equation of x squared minus 17x plus 70 is equal to 0. So now I'm looking at two numbers that multiply to 70 that add to negative 17. If it helps you to visualize it, draw out that cross. Product sum multiplies to 70, adds to negative 17. Right? It has to be two negatives, so it has to be a negative 10 and a negative 7. So my two factors would be x minus 10 times x minus 7, all equal to 0. So then when I solve, I get my two solutions. I get that x equals 10, x equals 7. So here's my two options, right? They could both work. It could be only one that works. So we want to plug back in to double check. So if I plug in a 10 right here, 10 minus 8 is 2. A square root of 10 minus 6, square root of 4 is also 2. So this one works, right? So x can be 10. Right, it produces a side length here and here of both two units. Okay, if I try the 7 
Here I would get 7 minus 8. Right away, I know that's not going to work. This measure would be negative 1. I can't have a side length that's negative, right? So x equals 7 is an extraneous solution. We were able to solve for it, but in plugging it back in, did not actually work. All right, moving over to y. So if I have two legs that are congruent, the two base angles opposite, they have to be congruent as well. So right now I know that y squared plus 7y equals 6y plus 20. Okay, so again, I see it's quadratic. I got to pull to one side. So I'm going to subtract the 6y over and the 20. So I have y squared plus y minus 20 is all equal to zero. So I've done my job. I have all of my terms on one side, all equal to zero. So now, again, I have to factor it down. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to be negative 20 that add to a positive one. And I love it when it has to add to a one or negative one because it tells me that the numbers have to be consecutive but one has to be negative, one has to be positive. So consecutive numbers are just numbers that come in sequence, like one and two, two and three, three and four, and so forth. So here I'm hopeful we see it's four and five, but one of them has to be the negative. So it should be y plus five and y minus four all equal to zero. Okay, keep going. We get a solution of negative five and positive four. But if I double check, let's say that I plug in the negative. So let's say that I plug it in right here. 6 times negative 5 would be negative 30, plus 20 would be negative 10. I can't have an angle measure that is negative, so this one is extraneous. right? We plugged it back in, it doesn't actually work. Let's try the 4. So here I have 4 squared, that is 16, uh, plus 7 times 4, that's 28. So 16 plus 28 would be 44. And then 6 times 4, 24, plus 20, back to 44. That works. y is 4. All right, the last two on this sheet I want you guys to practice. So I would love it if you would pause this video and practice these two problems. And then unpause, and you can watch me do them. Or you can check the key that's on my website. Two options. All right, I'm gonna walk through them when you guys are ready. Here we go. So in A, I'm giving you that TR is parallel to UK. So let's start with that given. So TR runs parallel to U, oh, sorry, UC, UC, not UK. All right, so TR runs parallel to UC. So let's look at that in the picture. TR to UC, right there. Let's emphasize, let's elongate those parallels. And then we have a transversal right here. All right, so building off of that, we should see, oh, we got this pair of corresponding angles right here and here. So those are corresponding angles. We know that they have to be congruent. So angle R, T, U is congruent to angle C, U, K. R, T, U to C, U, K. Let me catch up with myself. So the first step was given, and the second was the corresponding angles postulate. All right, so now I have a pair of angles. Now I need to look for another given. So here I get that TR is congruent to UC. So here, here, let me add it to my list. TR is congruent to UC. All right, that's kind of a dead end again. So now I need to go and pull my last given. We saw a very similar one earlier today. So we're saying that U is the midpoint of TK. So if U is the midpoint of a larger segment, it divides it into two congruent parts. So let me just first write that statement. Point U is the midpoint of TK 
given. And because it's the midpoint, it shows us that this segment is getting bisected, split into two congruent parts. So I can say that TU is congruent to UK, right? That's what it means to be a midpoint. It divides something into two congruent parts. So definition of midpoint. All right, so now I have two pairs of corresponding sides, one pair of corresponding angles. Uh, they are the included angles, so I can reach my conclusion that triangle TRU is congruent to triangle UCK. My reason would be side angle side. All right, one last one. Here we are given that CA runs parallel to RS. So CA, RS, like that. Let me write it and then I will build off of it. Right, that is given to us. All right, you know I love my colors, so let me emphasize these parallel pathways in bright red. And the diagonal, let me elongate it, view it as a transversal here in blue. So where do those parallels lead me? They lead me to this pair of alternate interior angles. So I can say the angle CAS is congruent to angle RSA. Alternate interior angles theorem. Okay, so now I'm dead ended. So I look at my other given right here. Angle one is congruent to three. Given. But those angles are outside of my triangles. I gotta fight my way in. So I need to recognize that again, these pairs of angles here are supplementary. One and two form a linear pair. Their measures would add to 180. They're supplementary. Same with three and four. So I need to just explicitly state that relationship. Angle one and two are supplements. So are three and four. And I know that because they form a linear pair. So linear pairs are always supplementary. Linear pair property. Okay, once I've established that link, I know that if I have a pair of congruent angles here, I've established that these pairs are both supplementary, then I can link up their supplements and say that they have to be congruent as well. If I say that in words, I can say that supplements of congruent angles also have to be congruent. So I can now get inside and say that two is congruent to four because of the congruent supplements theorem. And then I'm gonna mark my picture. Okay. So the last thing I need to do is look for a pair of sides that I can link up. And I see, ah, I got that shared side again. We see that all the time. We use reflexive property a lot in these triangle congruence proofs. Again, it's the directionality that we have to be clear on. So here I can say that if I name it from A to S for the top triangle, for the bottom one, it reverses S to A. I'm still linking a segment to itself, right? I'm saying it matches with itself. It's the same side for both triangles. So I'm saying reflexive property of congruence. And now I can reach my conclusion. I have two pairs of corresponding angles that are congruent, one pair of corresponding sides that are congruent, and it's not the included pair. The included pair would have been here and here. I can reach my conclusion now and say that triangle CAS is congruent to RSA, and my reason is angle-angle side. 
All right, I hope that this lecture has been helpful and especially with just reinforcing the style of proof that we've been seeing in this unit. Have a wonderful rest of your day.